So I'm a psychologist. What am I doing here? I'm not going to teach you anything about IVF, none whatsoever. Um, I am, however, going to tell you, I'm going to start with what I'm doing in, with regards to medical decision making. And I do quite a lot of things in that field. So the title of my talk is, you're talking to me, you know, like Robert De Niro, except not exactly the same thing. And I'm going to be talking about how to ensure patient comprehension, mainly comprehension, and then motivation and personalization, because my claim is, if you don't understand something, you're not going to be motivated. And I'm going to start by introducing myself academically. Zev already did that. Introducing my industry experience. And then I want to tell you about a morning I spent in 2004 at the Hadassah Medical Center. I was invited to teach the psychological um, principles of decision making to genetic counselors. I said, OK, but because I had children before I knew any of you guys and before I met genetic counselors, I said, I can't teach genetic counselors unless I know what their job looks like. So I came and I sat in on consultations. And the experience was very difficult because I saw a great professional, smart, knowledgeable, well-intentioned, equipped with a lot of information, standing here. I saw a patient, actually, with her husband and her baby, and the translator, because the patient was deaf, listening, obviously very motivated, wanting to receive all that information. And then I saw, as if there was a gap in the floor, and 90% of the information from the professional to the patient just fell through the gap. And that really sparked my interest, and from then on, I've been very committed to the idea of medical decision-making and to try to understand how to facilitate that, how to help professionals um, enable understanding with patients and how to help patients understand a little bit more. So the roadmap to the talk is how do we make patients do the right thing, and I'm going to claim that, yes, I'm, I'll be talking a lot about comprehension, but comprehension is not a goal in and of itself. It's the path to better adherence and to better patient behavior. I'm going to be talking about this in terms of um, the four no-nos, as I like to call them, the four things you should not be doing. And I think Avi is a champion at avoiding all these no-nos. So I'm really glad to be speaking immediately after him. We'll talk a little bit about motivation and a little bit about personalization. But we'll start with this question, with the patient who doesn't look like he really knows what's going on. Who should understand medical information? Are there any doctors here? Clearly. So you should understand medical information. Should the patients understand that? Well, it depends on the model you work with. If you work with a very paternalistic approach, you would say, I'm the doctor, I'll tell you what to do. And you'll do it, and don't ask me questions, because you have no say in the process. If you come from a shared decision-making perspective, you will want the patient to participate. Now, that doesn't mean she gets to say what the dosage is or any other of those medical decisions per se, but she will have some form of input into the process. This isn't just about because it's important. I mean, the BMJ published a paper from my collaborators and share decision-making, the Salzburg address almost, the Salzburg, the Salzburg statement on share decision-making, and in there they say nothing about me without me. That's great. But do you agree? Well, you don't have to agree. You have to ask, is this evidence-based? And the answer is yes, it is evidence-based. When patients are more empowered, they do things differently. It's not about being nice to the patient, it's about better outcomes. And we're talking about diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. We're talking about multiple conditions where having the patient participate in the decision-making process actually makes a difference. Um, additional results that we see here, patients, and we're talking about procedures like knee replacement, uh, hip surgery, etc., are less likely to undergo medical procedures, often at no disadvantage to their health. They're more likely to decline interventions, and I, as I said, and they're more likely to adhere to their medical regimes. So having the patient participate in the process is actually important, not just because we think it's nice, but because it actually um, assists the medical outcomes. Shared decision-making has many tenets, but I want to point out two of them. 
and they seem like a no-brainer. Okay, the first one, both parties take steps to participate in the process. You could say, duh, yeah, of course, right? Well, we're going to see it's not that trivial in a minute. And information sharing is a prerequisite. Um, one more question, and then I'll start bombarding you with information. Who should make medical decisions? A fourth of the patients say, only my doctor. Half say, me and my doctor. And a quarter say, well, just myself. And these, this is kind of old data. I don't know what it would look like right now. I wonder about the distribution. The fact of the matter is, the more you inform patients, even a little bit, the more equipped they feel to participate in the decision-making process. And like I said, it doesn't mean that they're going to change the protocol or decide when to inject or what type of medication they need to use. It just means that they feel they are taking part in the decision-making process, and when they're informed, they're likely to do that. So, do patients get it? An important question. I would like to ask another question, and that is, are they supposed to? What message are we sending to the patients, and are we really inviting them to the process? So, I'll be talking about four barriers to patient comprehension. I like to call them the no-nos, and the first no-no is talking above the patient's head. A simple example from a commercial website, DNA Direct, they are not doing pro bono work. They are trying to sell these DNA direct-to-consumer genetic kits. When you look at this and try to look at this not from professional eyes, try to look at it and count the words that are very long. How many are there? You know, more than one, more than five, more than ten. There are a lot of long professional words. The graphics indicate this is complicated. Even the founder of the company looks like she's not really getting it for sure. So when I'm a patient, when I'm a consumer, I'm looking at this and it's telling me, Talia, you're not, you're not smart enough. You're not going to get it. So what's the message here? Is there true information sharing or is there information sharing but also telling, guess what, this is not for you? Another example from the field of depression, and I did not make this up. Please read the line that's marked in red. Maybe it's true. It could be very honest to say that you don't know how the medicine works. But by saying that, by not giving any real explanation, you're really telling the patient, take this because I tell you so, and I know, I know best. Another example. A woman was um, prescribed beta blockers. She asked the doctor, what are those? He said, they're good for your heart. Asked the nurse, they're good for your heart. She gets them, she goes home, she looks at them and she thinks, well, it's a beta blocker, I'm blocking something in my body. Is that a good idea? I'm not really sure. Well, I don't know, I'm not, go I'm not going to take this medication. Why? Lack of comprehension. So you can say, this is self-explanatory. Everybody understands that, everybody knows, everybody can Google it. But the truth of the matter is, you can't always find credible information, and you have 90 million Americans of low health literacy. Their reading level is that of a sixth, year, sixth grader or less. So we can't really count on people understanding what we tell them. I want to show you results from a study I did at Princeton University. And I always say it's at Princeton, not just because I went there, um, but because Princeton University students are very smart. You can't say these students don't get it because they're stupid. They are not stupid. You can't say they don't get it because they're, they're women, they're hormonal, they're pregnant, they're anxious, none of the above. These are young students, they're not pregnant, they don't plan on getting pregnant, they're uber smart, and they're high achievers. So when you give them a task, they want to get it. And the task here was read a letter that was written to an expectant mother describing her triple serum screening results and tell us what the risk of this woman having a child is with Down syndrome. We presented the information in three formats, and this really feeds off the work of Gerard Gigerenzer, who presented here yesterday. The first is probabilistic format, and that's the standard format. This is how the Hadassah Medical Center sends information to women. And that's very clear, or should I say clear, to everyone because it's really standard. 
the probability of giving birth to a baby with Down syndrome for a woman with normal results in one is 1 over 724. That's the base rate. And then there is the, woman, the probability of having such a baby for a woman with your results. That's 1 over 181. The frequentist presentation doesn't talk about numbers so much. It talks about fetuses, babies. You can envision that. You can think of a room with 181 babies, and the one in the corner in the middle of wherever you want to put it is the one with the Down syndrome. So it's not numbers anymore. It's fetuses. It's babies. Does it make a difference? We shall soon find out. The last presentation format is the visual one, which really translates the frequentist format. This is the base rate. You have a lot of white circles and one black one with the Down syndrome. And then it's followed by this woman's risk, less black circles and one white one denoting the baby with Down syndrome. Do you think this makes a difference? Who thinks it's going to make a difference in comprehension? It's the same information, basically. Who thinks it's going to make a difference? OK, so I have some, some believers here, and that's great. And as you can see, understanding, just being able to answer a simple question, what is the risk of this woman to have a baby with Down syndrome with a probabilistic presentation format, which is really standard issue, is 33% in this very smart, savvy, non-anxious population. That's, I would say, a tad, if not more than a tad, disturbing. We have the visual presentation, which is better, and the frequentist presentation, which is substantially better. It's almost at 70%. Now, 70% is the best that we've gotten to, and that in and of itself is, again, disturbing. People don't always understand what we tell them, even if it's simple, even if they're smart, even if they're motivated.